I've mentioned in previous lectures that uh, Morley wavelets are an important component of uh, time frequency analyses of neural time series data. In this lecture, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Morley wavelets, what they look like, how to create them in MATLAB, uh, and what their frequency characteristics are. So here we see a Morley wavelet. Um, you can see it has a um, sort of oscillatory or sinusoidal component and it builds up, it starts at zero, it builds up and then it ramps down and it goes back to zero. Here you see a bunch of, of Morley wavelets. You can see they all look fairly similar, uh, but they look more or less compressed like, uh, like an accordion. Um, so these Morley wavelets are related to each other by having different frequencies. So this is a lower frequency wavelet and in green is higher frequency and in cyan you can see this very high frequency wavelet here. This is an image of a family of wavelets. Now to see how you get from a wavelet like this to a wavelet family that looks like this, what you have to imagine is that uh, the zero colors or the zero values here at the beginning and end are colored green. And the more negative the signal, the wavelet gets, the deeper blue it will be colored. And, um, and the more positive it gets, the more orange or red it will be. So you can imagine this time series, so here it's just plotted all in white, but you can imagine it going from green to blue to red to even dark, deeper blue and then up here through green and then uh, up to uh, deep red and then blue and red and so on. Now, once you see that, um, that pattern of colors, you can imagine kind of twisting this um, or rotating this sine wave so it goes into the screen, into the page. And then you could, uh, lie, you could slide that wavelet in, which now looks like a line, slide that into to one row on this image. So here, this, in this image, you see the color going at each row. The color goes from red to blue to red to blue to red to green. Um, and that corresponds to this going uh, down. So this first down is actually this very faint blue here. And then up, this corresponds to red. And then blue or negative corresponds to blue here. And so on, I think you get the idea. The, each row in this image corresponds to a wavelet that looks like this, but has a different frequency like this. Okay, this is an important concept here, going from uh, lines going up and down to, to rows in, a, in an image that are being colored, because when we do time frequency analyses, we're going to plot the results in exactly the same way, using exactly the same idea that we have, um, uh, for example, time frequency power at different frequencies going up and down, and we'll plot it in an image um, where we don't see it going up and down per se, but we see it going kind of, um, uh, well, up or down on the color scale. Okay, so how do we create a Morley wavelet? It's very simple. We start with a pure sine wave. We take a Gaussian and we multiply them point by point. So you might be thinking a little bit like a dot product, except with a dot product, we would sum all these values together, but we don't want to sum. We just pointwise multiply the Gaussian by the sine wave, and that gives us our uh, Morley wavelet. Um, very often I will just use the term wavelet uh, without specifying that it's a Morley wavelet. There are many, many types of wavelets. You can invent your own wavelets. Um, to create a wavelet, it just has to be a time series that starts at zero and ends at zero, and has to integrate to zero, so the sum of all these points has to be zero, so there have to be as many uh, or as strong positive points as there are negative points, and then you have a wavelet. For various reasons, some of which I will explain uh, later on in this lecture. Uh, Morley wavelets happen to be very useful, very, very important in, in neuroscience, in, uh, in neuroscience data analysis. But, you know, if you go around the world talking to people and you say wavelet, even though you might be thinking exclusively about Morley wavelets, you should just be aware that there are many other types of wavelets out there. Okay, so now we know the math for a sine wave and the MATLAB implementation at sine 2 pi ft. We know the MATLAB implementation of a Gaussian that's e to the minus t squared over 2s squared. And so now to make a Morley wavelet, it's very simple. We just pointwise multiply um, these two functions together. So let's have a look at this in 
MATLAB. <coughs> Here you can see I'm defining an sampling rate to be uh, kilohertz. And we define a vector of time from which we will create the wavelet. Now I mentioned in the last lecture on convolution that it's ideal to have your convolution kernel, which in this case is the wavelet, have an odd number of points. And the way to implement that is always by defining your your time vector for wavelets to go from minus something to plus that same thing. Um, of course, in units of uh, uh, relative to the sampling rate, um, and this will will uh, this will enforce that your wavelet has an odd number of points. So that's always good. So here's the frequency, 6.5 hertz. Of course, you can change this if you like. So now we create a sine wave. And now you see already, this is not a, a real valued sine wave, like what I showed in the, in the PowerPoint slide. This is a complex sine wave. So we have the two pi ft part. So that part you should see and recognize that this is a uh, sine wave. And then we have the Euler's part. So this is e to the i something, so e to the i k. And we discussed in the Fourier transform why we need to have complex sine waves that allows us to extract power and phase. I'm going to talk more about this in a few lectures. Um, but for now, yeah, so here we have a complex uh, sine wave. Here is where we create our Gaussian window. We have e to the minus t squared over 2s squared. And s here I define by this number 7 um, divided by 2 pi f. Um, so this division by 2 pi f, this is just a scalar. This is not anything terribly interesting that just um, helps us uh, define the, the Gaussian to be frequency band specific. Um, and this number 7, this is an actual parameter. In, in papers or in talks, you will often hear people talk about the parameters of their wavelets in terms of the number of cycles. And when someone says the number of cycles of a wavelet, they're referring to exactly this parameter here. So for the next several lectures, we're going to just ignore this parameter. This is an important parameter. It has non-trivial effects on what you can get out of the results, what you can see in the results of your analyses. But for now, just for simplicity, um, we are going to uh, just ignore this and, and, uh, and, and yeah, seven is okay. All right. If you try to run this cell prematurely, you will get an error. Of course you get an error because line 18 is missing. And so what I encourage you to do now is pause the video and um, create a Morley wavelet based on the information that we've already computed so far in this cell. So to create a Morley wavelet, we multiply a sine wave by a Gaussian. So the solution to line 18 is actually very straightforward. We take the sine wave and we do element-wise multiplication with the Gaussian. And then it works. So now we can see, if we look at figure 1, here's the real part of the sine wave. Um, so this looks like what you would expect. Um, here's the imaginary part of the sine wave. It looks a little bit wobbly. Um, and that's really just because there's a phase offset of, uh, of quarter cycle of 90 degrees between the imaginary part, which is the sine wave part, and the real part, which is the cosine part. So these are the two components of a complex Morley wavelet. Um, in, the, in a few lectures from now, we will discuss uh, or we will review why uh, you need to have this wavelet be complex and how to extract information out of that wavelet. So here we see the complex Morley wavelet in its three-dimensional glory. So we have the time axis and the real axis and the imaginary axis. And you can see, so first of all, this is kind of uh, neat to look at. It's fun to play around with. It's like this uh, um, corkscrewing disc through time. You can see if you um, line up the plot so you project through the, uh, let's see, I wanted to do it this way, through the imaginary axis. So now you just have the time axis and the real axis. Then you see what looks like the wavelet here from uh, just the real part of the wavelet. Um, and of course, you could do the same thing with the imaginary axis um, and so on. So if you like now, I encourage you to
um, to play around with some of these parameters to get a sense of what that's going to do to the wavelet. So you can uh, change the frequency, for example, and now I set it to 16 hertz, you can see it goes faster. You can, um, although we're not really talking about the implications of this parameter, the number of cycles, you can change it to see what the effect um, is on the wavelet. So we can set it to two, and you can see now the wavelets are very narrow. It's really just, uh, well, two cycles. Um, or you can set this to, let's say, 20. And now you can see uh, the wavelets are much, much wider. It goes from really, you know, over two seconds, maybe two and a half seconds of non-zero um, periods of the wavelet. And it also looks pretty neat uh, from this view. Okay, so I encourage you to play around with this a bit more. All right, here we see a uh, Morley wavelet in the time domain. And now you know, actually, this is just the real part of the Morley wavelet. What does a Morley wavelet look like in the frequency domain? Probably uh, you've already guessed that it looks like a, uh, like a Gaussian in the frequency domain. And the peak of the Gaussian in the frequency domain corresponds to the uh, frequency of the sine wave that was used to create, a, to create the, the wavelet. Furthermore, the width of this Gaussian in the frequency domain is related to or is defined by the width of uh, the Gaussian that was used in the time domain to taper the sine wave. So Morley wavelets always, always, always have a Gaussian shape in the frequency domain. That's very useful uh, because we will talk about edge artifacts in the future and how you can get edge artifacts uh, from sharp edges in, uh, in the time domain or in the frequency domain. One of the things that makes uh, Morley wavelets very powerful and very useful in neuroscience data analysis is that they contain no sharp edges in the frequency domain or in the time domain. So this means that when using Morley wavelets uh, in, in convolution for extracting time frequency information, you will never uh, get uh, or you will never really need to be concerned about edge artifacts contaminating your data because there are no edges in the time or in the frequency representation of a uh, Morley wavelet. Okay, so we can look at this very quickly in uh, MATLAB. Here this is very simple, I'm just taking the uh, fast Fourier transform of the complex Morley wavelet, defining a vector of frequencies. If this line looks a little confusing, then I encourage you go, to go back a few lectures and look up how we define uh, the frequencies resulting from a Fourier transform. Okay, and here you see that the Fourier transform has a Gaussian shape in the frequency domain. This Gaussian is now very uh, narrow because we used, uh, a, we created the, um, the wavelets in the time domain with a very large number of cycles. Um, so now we can set this back to seven uh, run this cell again, and then run this cell again, and now you can see the Gaussian is a little bit wider. So again, I encourage you to play around with some of these parameters a bit and see what the effects are on the frequency domain representation. Um, it's good at this point to, you know, start getting a little bit of an intuitive sense of the relationship between the width of the Gaussian in the time domain, and in particular this parameter, the number of cycles, and the width of the Gaussian in the frequency domain. Uh, but you don't need to get too hung up yet on what the implications are of this, because uh, we're going to have an entire lecture that just focuses on this parameter and what the effects of this parameter are on your data analyses. Oh, and I, there's one final thing I wanted to do just to convince you. Let me see this. Uh, <coughs> that the peak of this um, uh, Gaussian in the frequency domain is 6.5 hertz, which is uh, exactly what we define up here as the frequency of the sine wave that creates the Gaussian, in, or that creates the Morley wavelet in the time domain.